Mom, seriously, I'm trying to make a video. Can you give me one minute? Oh, let's try this again. Hi, and welcome to the Spring Hill Equine Seminar. If you're new, like me, don't worry. It's gonna be fun. We'll give everyone a chance to grab some food and get comfy, and then we'll get started. Mom, I'm working here. You're always embarrassing me. Okay, I think we're about ready to go. to you guys uh, before we start the disaster preparedness seminar I just want to say that we did not plan this well we didn't have Ian come so that you guys would be primed to listen to a disaster preparedness seminar we had this planned way before Ian so we're sorry if Ian like got everyone in the mood for a disaster preparedness seminar that wasn't our goal so uh, a couple things, some w biggest housekeeping thing at the moment is wellness sign up has started. So if you want to sign up for our wellness program, you have between now and February 1st to get signed up for that. It is an awesome opportunity to take care of all of your horses healthcare needs for the year and no emergency fees. You get to see our bright shining faces. You don't have to remember anything like it's amazing it's fantastic and you save money so all the things you could ever want for your horse so we are tonight going to talk about disaster preparedness feel free to shout out questions feel free to type questions we'll get it all figured out um, we'll get your questions asked as best we can um, and we have this in three sections so dr carter who is our newest veterinarian that i'm going to introduce in a moment is going to talk about preparing i'm going to talk about what to do when it's over we're going to talk about horses and Dr. Spizak is gonna come in and fill in the blanks for all the critters that we don't know anything about uh, and, and cover the rest of them in those two scenarios. Now, a lot of what we talk about pre and post applies to everything. So she's sort of filling in what's different about dogs and cats, because it's not like you need to make sure that they're in a safe place outside your home. You can bring them inside. I wouldn't mind bringing my horses in. But anyway, so she's gonna fill in the gaps on some of those guys. So I'd like to bring Dr. Carter up here. Uh, Dr. Carter is our newest veterinarian. She comes to us from the great white north of Illinois, yeah. <laughs> but she likes, she likes winter here better. So um, Dr. Carter has a lifelong history with horses and she's excited to be here and offers acupuncture. So without further ado, I'm gonna let Dr. Carter get started. Thank you, Dr. Latter. All right, so we're gonna start with what to do before the disaster and to prepare um, in case there's a storm coming. So it's important to make sure your property um, especially where animals are kept um, is free of debris and objects that may be thrown around during the storm and this can include um, having trees trimmed um, and picking up loose branches and equipment um, around your property um, and then another important thing to do well in advance of a storm is to um, find a way to properly identify your animal um, and the clearest and most traceable form of identification is a microchip. Um, it's a small pellet that's implanted in the nuchal ligament of the horse, and it's a relatively painless procedure. Um, and then once it's scanned, the microchip can lead the finder to your contact information. Um, and at Spring Hill, we um, offer that service for $55. Um, and then, uh, other less permanent forms of identification can include tying um, an ear tag with your phone number into the mane. There are also commercially made 
main tags and Fetlock bands that can be purchased in advance of the storm. Um, you can also do things like livestock paint um, and using that to write the number down the side of your horse. Um, and others, if you do have a horse that has a white fetlock, um, <laughs> uh, you can use a permanent marker and write your phone number um, on their white markings. Um, and then before the storm, you've really got to make the decision early on whether you're planning to stay or whether you're trying, uh, planning to evacuate. Because um, in the case of hunkering down and sheltering in place, um, it's important to have at least a week of feed saved and stored um, in a place above the ground in, um, in case there's flooding. Um, and it's also important to take into consideration having enough water um, for your horse because a horse can drink um, up to six to 10 gallons of water a day. And so you can do things like storing it in a clean garbage can or a large water trough. Um, and finally, having a first aid, first aid kit fully stocked in cases where um, an injury may occur. Um, and a veterinary might not be able to come to your place immediately. Um, and then if you're planning to evacuate, make sure to you make plans in advance. Um, it's really difficult to evacuate once the storm is close due to traffic, traffic and possible flooding. Um, determine what facility you'll be hauling to and make sure you're aware of what the requirements are for vaccines and Coggins. You'll also need um, Coggins to cross state lines when you're coming back into Florida. So it's always important to keep that up to date yearly so you don't have to rush in the case of an emergency. And again, having that first aid kit with you. Um, and this is just a, kind of a basic list of some of the equipment that you'd want in your first aid kit, including a stethoscope and thermometer and knowing your horse's normal values before there's an injury, um, disinfectant, antibiotic ointment, some bandaging, um, extra halters and lead ropes, um, bandage scissors, Duct tape is always helpful. Um, and then uh, having an extra supply of medications that your horses take regularly, as well as banamine or triple I ointment. Um, and that concludes what you need to do to get ready. And we'll switch to Dr. Latcher. OK. So we have a message on uh, the Facebook so far about a group in Australia getting a uh, like it's a sheep station, so that's a lot of sheep, trying to get them out of the way of floodwaters. So that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about is now you have, you know, sort of the floodwaters or whatever has happened kind of come into the area. So what do you do to manage that now? So the big thing that I do after any of this is the, the first thing I want to do is get my eyes and my hands on everybody. Make sure you're checking. First, let's check if everyone's there. We're going to talk about that in a second, but a, do a head count. <laughs> How many are here? Um, next, we're going to, in particular, if it's been a wind event, like a hurricane, we're going to check eyes and make sure that the eyes are okay, we don't have debris, we don't have any indication of an ulcer going on, anything like that. The next thing that I always want to go over is legs. And certainly, you know, this is a big injury. It's an easy one to see. But as you guys all know that we preach all the time, it's the small injuries that can get you in big trouble. So I make sure that I run my hands down the entire horse all over the place and make sure that I'm catching any of those tiny injuries that I can find um, or that I'm worried about. I'm going to take a picture of those, even if I may not be able to get a signal out right now, um, then I've got it for later in case I need to do that later. Um, and then I'm going to check the rest of the body. And sometimes it's easy, you know, like here we've got uh, a nice chest wound. This is a nice... Uh, um, actually, so it, that one kind of comes like this, right? So you walk up to that horse and you're like, whoa, and there's this huge thing. And in general, it's sort of a general rule, but the body wounds, we don't worry about. We're going to deal with them. We're going to manage them. But those are not the ones that are typically, they can be, but they're not typically the life-threatening ones. It's the tiny one on the leg that's going to take them out. So I try very hard in a situation like this not to get kind of gobsmacked by the, you know, the big wound on the body kind of deal and make sure that I check everything over. Um, so that's why I put check the body last. All right, if, if someone is missing, um, I don't know if you guys have seen all the posts recently for the horse that's missing in Fort Myers. I have not checked today, but last I saw they had not located that horse yet. Um, but if the internet is working, it's your friend. Get everything out on social media that you can. 
contact neighbors, um, you know, contact anyone around you who has any idea of kind of where horses hang out when they get loose. You know, behind my house is, I do not want one of mine to get loose. Behind mine is 380 acres of basically vacant land. That's not fun to look for a horse on. But remember that for the most time, part, horses are going to go find other animals because you've all seen a horse who's by themselves. They're sure they're going to die because they're the only horse on the planet. So for the most part, it's checking in with everyone around you to see if they've got an extra horse. Um, next, you want to check with first responders in the area because typically what we do is try to start bringing animals to a location. So, you know, oh, you found a cow, you found a horse, we're going to put livestock here. Uh, dogs and cats are going to go here. You know, the miscellaneous, we're going to figure out where we can put those guys. But for the most part, livestock goes one place, small animals go another. So it's checking in with those guys. This is where having some of those marks on your animal makes it very easy and clear for people to say, oh, this horse goes with this address. And that's what your phone number does beyond just being your phone number. It gives first responders information about who you are, where you live, all of those sorts of things that they can get from it. Um, I, with this horse that is missing in Fort Myers right now, I do know they've used a lot of drones, and I thought that was fantastic, recruiting all those teenagers with drones to fly around and look for your horse. It's like a video game in real life. Um, and it's allowed them to look at a lot of property and cross it off the list. You know, like basically they're trying to cross off where can we not look anymore, so where can we go next? And the drones have been really helpful. Um, the other thing is to carefully look around the farm to see, you know, with, with what happened in Fort Myers, it's not easy to be like, oh, there's the hole in the fence because the entire fence was taken down. But carefully looking around your property to see if there's clues as to which direction a horse may have gone to, to come out of the property. Um, so th there's how we, we kind of handle if someone's missing. The next thing I do after I sort of check everyone over is I try to carve out a safe place. So identify places on the property that are high, because as we know in particular with hurricanes, the, wa the water we have today <laughs> may be different than the water we have tomorrow or the next day. So identifying places on my property where I've got high and dry area, but that is also easy for me to get food and water there because remember especially you know those of us in Florida are used to hurricanes but you know we can be without power I mean I, I live a mile from the clinic the clinic had power back in Hurricane Irma in 12 hours and I didn't have it for eight days so being able to get food and water two horses thinking about that location like I don't want one horse there and one horse there I want them as consolidated as I can be and areas where I can get vehicles too, so I can relatively easily get them fed and watered. Um, I want to pick some place that has the least debris I have to clear, <laughs> because time, you know, you run out of hours in the day in these scenarios trying to get it all done. Uh, and then, if possible, I think about if I can manage manure from this location well. Um, is it something where I can easily get manure? Because I'm going to have them in smaller spaces for a period of time, and I need to be able to get the prodigious amounts of manure that horses create out of that spot. Um, and then if I have the ability to shelter in that location, great, but it's the least of my concerns for Florida. Other places it may factor higher on your list if you're in a cold environment and you're you know, dealing with blizzard type disasters, you may be looking at can I get shelter there before some of these other problems. All right, next you want to photograph everything. So you've got kind of the basics handled. Your horse is okay. They're, they're in a place where they're going to be all right. Next, you want to photograph everything. Horse, house, barn, fencing, vehicles, anything that has damage, you want to document it, um, mostly for the insurance company. Um, but this is the time to really go around and make sure that everything that has damage, you've documented thoroughly. Um, now you're going to contact insurance. And why do I have this in here? It's not really you know, kind of what we do, but I just want to make sure that we, we cover this space a little bit. Um, one of the big reasons you're taking all of those images is so that you can show it to insurance companies that this is what happened, um, because many of them try to require assessments before cleanup can begin. Uh, one of my friends was trying, she's got a hole in her roof and they can't put a tarp on the roof until a roof person comes and looks at it or the insurance company won't cover the roof. Well, you can imagine that in Fort Myers right now, finding someone to put a tarp on your roof is not easy. 
So she's trying to document as much as she can in case she needed to kind of emergency figure out how a, a tarp went on her roof before it rained. So like I said, being really diligent and documenting everything. Um, you're going to need to spend a lot of time contacting your insurance agent. Uh, these guys are going to be massively overwhelmed in this scenario because remember it wasn't just you, it was everyone. And you may have spotty cell phone and internet service. So I always tell people be prepared for the long haul. I know your rope is thin, everybody else's is too, and it's, it's not, nothing about it is easy. When you do get a hold of someone, you want to make sure that you ask very detailed questions about what is and isn't covered. And this includes your barn, your fence, your run-in sheds, your water lines out to the, the fields. You know, think about everything that you are going to have to repair, which is another reason your rope might be thin. Uh, and ask specific questions of insurance agents on if all of that is covered. Um, and then, based on the roofing thing, ask what can I start working on now? Like, what do you have to see before I can start fixing on it, fixing, and what can I do right now? Um, in any of these areas, there are typically, there are people there helping. It's sometimes hard to find them in the, the early stages, and I know that's frustrating. It often takes 48 to 72 hours to get responders actually into an area. And that's, when you're thinking about preparing, think about that, right? That you need 48 to 72 hours before, I mean, it's hard to get people in. So, you know, not just that, but you know, the, the state rescue team has to contact us. We have to figure out, you know, if we're on the list, like, can, am I in a position where at the moment I can drop everything and head there? So they're, they're trying to gather the people who can do that at the moment and get them to there. Once they are there, you'll find that distribution centers for things are your friend because they become the distribution center for supplies and information. <laughs> And it's definitely a group source thing, you know, talk to all of the other people there about their scenario and what they've done and what they've gotten. Unfortunately, each disaster is a little bit different. Um, FEMA tries really, really hard, but it is a bureaucracy. So you can, you know, sometimes it's saying the right word on the right form, on the right day to the right person. And, you know, everyone kind of finding that information together and group sourcing it is the best way to do it. You also want to make sure you check with your neighbors, not just to make sure that you guys are disseminating information, but also to make sure that they have what they need. You know, especially if you've got elderly or neighbors with a lot of small children, you know, tiny, tiny children. Um, you know, if you're that age, you can, you can help. <laughs> um, but, you know, trying to see if there's, there's help other people need if they're in a worse position than you or if they've got information that they can help you with. So I think it's definitely a time for everyone to come together and work on, work on things. Um, the other thing about these guys is be prepared for a long, long journey. Um, you know, we all know from having watched hurricanes come, luckily, you know, Irma took out our power, but honestly, around here, it wasn't worse than that. Um, 2006 was certainly a long journey when the three hurricanes crisscrossed the state here. Um, but when there is massive devastation, it takes a long time. And the, the groups of people that are there to help are typically there aggressively in the first few days and it's gonna be a long time. So I always try to be very upfront with people that um, this was Hurricane Michael when it hit. This was the picture in um, the New York Times, I believe two days later in the middle, and the one on the end was eight months later. And it doesn't look that different. There's chain link fences around the houses because they haven't been able to go in and fix the housing. Um, so they ended up just putting chain link fences around it and they were like, we'll get to it when we get to it. Um, so again, it's, it's a long, long, long haul and it's definitely more of a marathon than a sprint. So I tell everyone the day after, be prepared, you're in a marathon. Day before, be prepared, you're in a marathon. So um, the other thing that I like to do is make sure that we keep up on routine care. So we talked about this. Um, flood water brings diseases without a doubt. It brings diseases, it brings toxins. Floodwaters are nasty. So if in any way, shape, or form your disaster involves floodwater, be prepared for disgustingness. The faster we can get animals out of it, the better. We actually have a very low survivability on animals that have been in water um, above the level of their legs. So if you have a quadruped, you know, kind of if they're up to this level, we don't do well saving them if they've been in water for three days. 
So once we hit that three-day mark, it gets really scary. Um, there are also increased hazards in these situations in terms of, you know, there's sharp things underwater. Um, you know, maybe the wound isn't bad enough that it's life-threatening, but it can cause tetanus. So having your routine vaccines like we talked about in preparation up to date, and again, in that long slog after making sure that those things still happen so that you're ready to manage diseases on the backside as well. Um, and you have stressed out animals and humans. <laughs> and stressed out animals don't respond as well to our vaccines. So again, it's making sure that now's not the time to, to let go of routine care. We need to make sure that they are ready to go for that long haul. So, and now we're gonna talk about keeping the rest of the critter safe too. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Spizak. For those of you that don't know me, um, I do the dogs and the cats as well as the ruminants here at Spring Hill. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about ruminants um, because basically everything that we talked about for horses applies to them as well. Um, but we are going to talk about dogs and cats because like Dr. Latcher said, we can actually bring them inside, um, unlike our horses that we have to sort of usually figure out an outside situation for. Um, so the really important things to know are that we can't always bring our pets with us to emergency shelter type facilities if we do have to evacuate. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. So um, the ASPCA and FEMA both recommend once a year checking with your local authorities and seeing what their general policies are. Not that that won't change in a, in a disaster, but at least find out their general policies um, so that you know where you can take your pets. Um, and just remembering that if you feel the need to evacuate and your home isn't safe for you, it is not safe for your dogs and cats. Um, and almost everything I say today is going to go as well for exotic pocket pets, things like that. Um, so just quick caveat there. I searched today um, for sort of where you could take pets in Alachua County. And it looks like this was their protocol. This was actually their protocol for Irma, but it doesn't look like it's been updated since then, which was that if you as a, a human family were going to an Alachua County emergency shelter, um, you could bring your pet, but your pet would actually be removed from there and taken to Alachua County Animal Services. So you wouldn't get to stay with your pet, but hopefully your pet would be in a safe space until you could reunite with them. Something really important to know. Um, so a disaster supply kit, similar to kind of a first aid kit for horses, but for dogs and cats, it's a lot more about bringing them with you and having their basic medical supplies. All of what you, whatever you bring should be in a waterproof container. Um, <laughs> all of what you bring should be in a waterproof container. Um, the big things are going to be food, water, and medications. We recommend keeping at least five to seven days worth in that container um, and making sure that you switch out the food and water on a regular basis. So if you've got dry food in bags in there. Make sure every couple of months or so you're rotating those through so that you don't have expired food or water or medications in there. Um, for medications, considering sedatives, um, I'll talk about this later, but if your dog or your cat routinely needs sedatives to get through a thunderstorm, you best believe they're going to want some sedatives to get through a hurricane or another disaster. Veterinary records, always a really good idea to have those in physical copy if possible. Most of us have them somewhere on our phones, but um, having them in a physical copy if you don't have access to the internet or, or technology is a really great idea. Extra leashes, collars, and harnesses, um, those things break, uh, we lose them. So having extras of those for all of your animals a current photo of your pets, um, and I should have added on here, the best is to have a photo of your pets with you because that helps to reunite you. So go home tonight, do a little pet photo shoot, get them printed, and put them in your disaster kit. Um, the last couple things are mostly for cleanup, so paper towels, litter box and litter if you've got kitties, um, and then zip top bags, which so is like Ziplocs to, to contain trash, litter, um, anything you can think of. All of that in a nice kit is a really good option. This is my PSA, cats need carriers. So if you have seven cats, you need seven carriers. I know that's a lot, um, but seven cats is also a lot. And just think about... Wait, wait. Seven cats is not a lot. <laughs> seven cats is not a lot according to Dr. Latcher, but you know, it's okay. Um, <laughs> so unless you love any one of your cats less than the other ones, which I don't think any of us do, you need a carrier for each of your cats, basically. And this also sometimes goes for small dogs. Um, if it's something, if it's an animal that doesn't do well, you know, sort of on a leash loose, they should have a carrier. They do make um, these really cool carriers that are on the right here um, that are a little bit bigger and they have room for a litter box. Um, if you are in a situation where you need to be in a shelter, in a hotel, 
any type of situation like that where the, the animal's not going to be able to run loose, um, having a larger carrier that you can put a litter box in is really helpful for the kitties. Um, now, for the disasters where we decide we are going to hunker down, we are going to stay home, um, we still need to think about our dogs and cats. Definitely bring your pets inside. Um, with this last storm, we had uh, a, couple, a couple friends of the clinic and, and technicians that brought their outdoor cats inside and sort of either made them a home in a, in a bathroom or a guest room or something like that because we were worried about flooding, we were worried about the winds. Um, so definitely consider doing that. Keep them leashed for dogs anytime they go outside. Even, honestly, just in your front yard or your backyard, if there is a storm that's actively coming at you, your animal should be on a leash when they're going outside because anything can happen. Lightning can strike, they can freak out, and they will run. Um, keep collars on them. This goes even for dogs that don't usually wear collars in the house. Again, if there's a storm going on, a situation going on, and you are hunkering down, they should have a collar on them, and it goes without saying, with an ID tag on it, with your information on it. Um, so being ready to evacuate. So like Dr. Carter talked about, we do want to try to make an evacuation decision a few days before the storm, if at all possible, um, but still have that disaster kit ready so that if things change on a dime and you need to go, you're ready to go and you're ready to bring your dogs and cats and smaller animals with you. Um, so being prepared to clean up waste in the house. If it is storming and there's a hurricane outside, you cannot expect your dogs to either go outside in that mess or to hold it for 16 hours where you all hunker down. Um, this picture here shows a really great idea that um, I have used before in my own animals. Um, you get a kiddie pool from Walmart or whatever, and you get a pack of sod, just one, one square of sod or a couple if you've got big dogs, and you put it in there. You can put that in your garage, you can put that in a bathroom, whatever, um, but that is a somewhat familiar location that is real grass that dogs are more likely to use versus a dog that's never used a pee pad before or something like that. Um, and the big uh, you know, caveat at the bottom here is if they do have accidents in the house, do not punish them. You should never punish them for accidents anyway. That's another discussion. But um, it is not their fault. Storms are scary, and they don't know what's going on. So just be aware that when you're keeping your dogs and cats inside and there's something scary going on outside, accidents may happen, and we just we clean it up and we move on. Another reminder to microchip your dogs and cats. You microchip those just like your horses. Um, so all dogs and cats should be microchipped. We can do that uh, here for your animals at Spring Hill. Um, we, can, uh, we often recommend it when you spay or, or neuter your puppies or kittens, but we can do it anytime. Um, and you want to make sure that your microchip is registered. Too often we have animals that have a microchip put in, but that microchip is registered to the shelter where the dog was adopted or something like that, and it was never actually registered to the current owner. Um, you should be able to register it with the original company that that microchip comes from, but if you can't do that or you don't want to do that, there's a company called AKC Reunite that you can register any microchip from any company, um, and I, I don't remember the cost, I think it's like $20 a year or something like that, but you can register any microchip and um, have your information on it. A buddy system. This um, is an idea from, I think, the AKC and FEMA, um, but basically it is setting up a buddy system with somebody in your general vicinity, but maybe not directly in your neighborhood, so that if you can't get to your house or um, your neighborhood is not, not doing well in the storm, but somebody else is doing okay, somebody else has access to your home, they have a spare key, they know your animals, and they can potentially either take your pets and house them for a period of time while you're dealing with your own situation, or if maybe you're a first responder and maybe you can't be home, if you've been called away and you can't get to your animals, they have access to your animals and access to your home, and they know the plan, they know where your disaster kit is, and they can help you out in that situation. And hopefully you can do the same for them if their neighborhood is in trouble. So setting that up ahead of, an, of, of a disaster um, so that you can get that figured out. The other good option um, is for um, if you unfortunately can't get back to your home, don't have a buddy system in place, and you've got dogs and cats at home, they, there's a bunch of stickers like this one on the right here that you can buy from a variety of places that you put on your front window of your house, um, and that tells first responders and emergency personnel how many dogs, cats, or other animals you've got in your home so that if there is an emergency situation at your home and there's not a human there, they know what they're looking for. Um, and then a plan for moving multiple animals. That's another big one. So if you've got a bunch of big dogs and you drive a Mini Cooper, um, then having a plan for who you're going to call, what you're going to do to get those animals out of your home if you need to. It's just like with horses. If we've got to move them somewhere and we don't own a trailer, 
we have to have a friend with a trailer. So same thing, if you've got seven Great Pyrenees and you, know, you drive a Corvette, then you need to have a friend with a, a van. <laughs> um, same reminder as for horses, um, keeping them up to date, um, mostly because I love to see healthy puppies at vet visits. So um, keep them up to date with your veterinarian. That means exams, that means vaccines, infectious disease testing, um, flea and heartworm prevention. We don't want to get a call the day that the storm is, hit, is hitting that you're out of your, your regular monthly flea heartworm prevention um, because we're all scrambling to try to deal with our emergency situations as well. Chronic meds, especially dogs on life-threatening condition that have life-threatening conditions like heart disease, um, diabetes, things like that. Make sure you always have a stock of that type of medication because that is the last thing you want to have to deal with is running out of a very important medication as a storm is barreling down at us. And again, I said I'd mention this um, a second time, sedatives. Um, so if your dog or cat needs a sedative type medication to get through thunderstorms, 4th of July fireworks, New Year's fireworks, all that good stuff um, that they're really scared for, a storm approaching is a really good time to utilize those medications as well. And so you definitely want to talk to your veterinarian about what the best option would be for them. There are a variety of really good, really safe medications that we can use. And if you have a great relationship with your veterinarian and you are up to date on all of your general healthcare things, many veterinarians would be more than happy to, to have you have a small supply of those medications if a storm is coming through. And after, very briefly, um, just knowing that behavior may change in dogs and cats. They may get aggressive, they may get withdrawn, um, they may be very cuddly, very hyperactive. They may just change their behavior because they've gone through a whole disaster and evacuation just like, just like you have. Um, and so you want to give them a couple of days, a couple of weeks to get back to their normal selves. Try to keep the routine as, as the much the same as you can. If you are in an evacuated shelter type situation, that can be really, really hard. Um, but doing your absolute best to keep the routine uh, on a schedule for them is going to help both dogs and cats get through those tough days where they know their humans are stressed, they're stressed, they're in a new environment, or their home environment has changed. Everything smells different um, and it's very scary. If this goes on longer than a few weeks after the, the major storm or major disaster, then that's a time to contact your vet. Maybe talk about um, making sure that there isn't something medical going on, that they got injured or got a disease during the storm um, and see if there's anything that we can do to help them moving forward. If you do evacuate and come back to your home, um, you wanna make sure that you're checking for hazards at dog and cat and small animal level. Um, so just making sure that we're picking up anything around the, the yard, outside the home, as well as inside the home, um, that there's nothing that's been displaced or moved that could injure our dogs and cats when they're coming back home. And that is it for our little extra dogs and cats. Oop. Um, I will uh, say thanks and I will um, remind you all that um, we have another seminar next month on November 17th that is going to be on lab work. So we're going to talk about lab work for all species, dogs, cats, ruminants, and horses, um, different blood work, different laboratory diagnostic tests, everything like that, um, and sort of teach you about that and why we want to do it. Now I think Dr. Latcher is coming up or you have questions. Oh, so we have a question back on our horses topic. Where's the best place to put horses during a storm, inside or outside? Generally, for our horses and our other livestock animals, outside is always the safest. Sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but they have been outside during storms a lot longer than all of us have, um, and so they know how to find the best, the safest place. Yeah. Yes, same thing with goats. So generally, with all livestock species, outside is the best place. Part of, the, part of the reason of that is because, again, they've been around, they know what they're doing, um, but also when we put them in barns, we put a, them at a high risk for flooding, not being able to get out of that situation, and debris sort of from the building around them causing an issue. We good? Any more questions? Okay. Any other questions here? Yeah. Um, either one. I was going to 
oh, sorry. So the question is, um, for horses, um, should we put fly masks on? Should we put light blankets on? Things like that kind of before a storm. Um, I would say fly masks are definitely a good option because that's going to at least give them some protection. The caveat being that when you are checking them after the storm, we make sure we remove the fly mask to look at the eyes, look at the face, everything like that. Um, blankets are sometimes a little bit trickier because we don't want them to get caught on things. Um, but I would say fly masks for sure um, are, a good, are a good plan. Any other questions? <laughs> Last chance. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Then we'll uh, then we're done for tonight. We will see you guys all in person or online same time, six thirty, November seventeenth, to learn all about lab work and diagnostic tests for all of your critters. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Bye.